morning students today we are going to continue lecture series on english literature so here we will discuss on literary criticism unit 8 from which is prescribed for the syllabus of nta neat exam in the beginning discuss in literary criticism the point criticism so here we will discuss at the beginning we will discuss uh, nature and function of criticism but before that we should try to understand what is criticism so criticism is the interpretation and philosophical discussion on any work of art it is an evaluation of a piece of work of art or literature with respect to society or culture and value system talking about the nature of the criticism or the function of criticism so the word criticism is uh, come from the word criticos k r i t i k o s and the word criticos means to judge and interpret the writer or the person who interprets a literary work it's called critic the objective of criticism is shifted from judging literature to interpreting literary works by various writers for example greek and latin writers the critical post analysis of these works kind kindled over curiosity literary criticism and theory have expanded the boundaries of literature they continue to play a vital role they have been assigned in order to redefine redefine the meaning of a particular text literary criticism is the practice of interpreting and writing about literature whereas literary theory is a composite study of principles through which critics stand to reason works of literature in other words it is basically a consolidation of the former there are some statements by the writers such as pg williams says who is a literary critic actually the function of a literary critic is the evaluation of what has been written in terms of aesthetic principle appropriate to literature terry galton says some texts are born literary some achieve literariness and some have literariness thrust upon them scottish philosopher david hume uh, says the ideal critic was a true standard of taste and beauty and he should be unprejudiced the famous uh, english poet and critic says uh, the criticism is a disinterested endeavor unbiased by critics own process of learning and influence distinctively the best thought and said to the said in the world Dryden said, "Criticism is the capacity of the work of art that transcends the people of its age. It makes the work great. It is not the obligation of critic to observe trivial culpi culpabilities, but to discover the great exquisiteness that makes it immortal." Immortal. Talking about the uh, criticism next we must discuss about the types of criticism 
at the beginning we will discuss about the first type of criticism that is aesthetic criticism actually the main objective of aesthetic criticism is to celebrate the beauty of work the fetters of rules fetters of rules prescribed in accord with legislative criticism constraint literature with perceptions of the ancients they restrict the imaginative power of the poet or writer aesthetic criticism felicitates literature as an art literature and independent activity it is concerned with the principles or main beliefs in the work of art thereby the absolute nature of creativity having an end of its own it has not relation with logic or science it proves the nature of the literary art and formulates theories accordingly the first aesthetic the first authentic example of the theoretical or aesthetic criticism which is given so the example of aesthetic criticism is an apology for poetry by philip sydney the next one is uh, legislative criticism legislative criticism is the recent form of criticism it it dominantly or prominently aims at teaching how to write better it is based on established criteria it apprehends the nature and quality of the art work it is applied particularly on the works written in greek and latin legislative criticism claims to teach the poet how to write or how to write better the augustans propounded that the vital function of the criticism was to frame is to frame certain rules to supervise the writers legislative criticism originated at the time of the elizabethan period nearly all elizabethan critics adopted legislative criticism thus directing their criticism to the poet rather than readers of poetry it is it basically teaches the writer how to write better uh, the example of legislative criticism is uh, philip sydney and john dryden the next one is uh, judicial criticism judicial criticism judges a work of art based on a set of rules and conventions those rules and conventions are written by ancient greek and latin writers such as aristotle horace quintilian all through the classical era judicial criticism held influence and dr johnson may be regarded as the most powerful proponent of this type of criticism dr johnson's point of view implies an excessive denial of the individual's right to his own impressions and feelings the next one impressionistic criticism impressionistic criticism is the record of the personal experiences of the writer an impressionistic critic is not deals either with the aesthetic approach of art but with the biographical exploration of a piece of art in this the critic aims to present work of literature and condition by explanation it often takes the impact of the piece of the work as a whole the main idea is to explicate reaction response 
the reaction response is considered idiosyncratic i d i o s y n c r a t i c so this reaction response is considered idiosyncratic relative and fruitful oscar wilde george moore arthur simmons and virginia woolf are the famous critic who attempted impressionist criticism impressionist impressionist criticism is an indiaistic it tends to the errant and inconsistent owing to impress, impressionist criticism t s eliot and other uh, modern critics stress the need for tradition and knowledge of writers of the past to be used in their work there is a next criticism is uh, evaluative criticism evaluative criticism talking about evaluative criticism its primary and most objective is to evaluate uh, to evaluate properly the works of great critics so that a common reader can grasp the real worth of an artist evaluative criticism classifies what is good or what is valuable it uh, it bases these findings on consolidated facts uh, it advises that define uh, where to focus the analysis in other words evaluative criticism seeks to vet the merit of a work of art and literature accessing literature texts into account all the elements that comprise literature the this includes questioning the rhythm and movement thought and emotion imagery and suggestion word and meaning there is a next uh, form or type of criticism is descriptive criticism descriptive criticism is the most angus form of criticism it consists of a study of individual works of their aims methods and effects Le uh, uh, legislative criticism addresses the writer whereas descriptive criticism is directed towards the readers it is believed to be the art of analyzing any work of literature that is written it is established on the behalf of discussions analysis appreciation and interpretation of individual literary works writers such as ben jonson who has analyzed their own works with a view to explain their aims his aims and methods descriptive criticism always focuses on a particular text whether of critic's own or of another and the critic it analyzes the work in hand it traces the influences that have given rise to it and then does the criticism thoroughly of each part is example of descriptive criticism uh, uh, such as conversations with dramond by ben jonson uh, essay on dramatic poetry by john dryden there is a next type of criticism is a uh, uh, comparative criticism sort about comparative criticism tends to evaluate a work by comparing it with other works it was disseminated by matthew arnold for for example uh, iliad by homer may be compared with mahabharat Matthew Arnold asserted that it is the duty of a critic to know the best that has been thought and said both in ancient and modern literature 
the critic must know classic comparisons with similar works the comparison must be done implicitly with genre and the same type arnold call it the touchstone method which is both illuminating and interesting there is a next type of criticism is psychological criticism psychological criticism is a method to understand characters and not to diagnose them a critic uses psychological theory in order to understand how and why the characters in any work of literature behave in psychological criticism a critic applies a theory that has been developed by a psychologist psychological criticism has been prevalent in the modern age interpretation of dream by sigmund freud is the one of the example but uh, a a brill has translated this work interpretation of dream by freud and it greatly influenced both literature and literary criticism freud constructed sorry freud constructed man and human nature in the light of his uh, uh, compulsions and the repression society forced upon him according to freud man is sick rather than villainous the unconscious is in itself in varied manifestations this idea of psychological exploration in criticisms captivated the Rom uh, romanticist under the influence of freudian psychology both the romantic and realistic writers began to delve deeper in the exploration of the unconsciousness and regressions manifested in mankind the influence of psychology upon the artist literature was consolidated by adler's concept of inferiority complex and theory of collective unconscious by carl jung the writers such as virginia wolf catherine mansfield graham green dylan thomas and jem joyce write about the psychology of various characters in their works psychological criticism has its own limitations it is often connected to criticisms of the psychologist and psychological theory applied rather than the critical framework as whole the next one is inductive criticism inductive criticism rejects a set of rules and principles in judging works of literature inductive criticism applies certain methodologies in the literature that direct towards the spirit of pure investigation according to richard moulton m o u l t e n inductive criticism reviews the phenomena of literature as they actually stand inductive uh, criticism is important in literary criticism also it instructs that laws of art are found in the practice of artist and not in the set of rules next one is uh, archetypal criticism archetypal criticism is also uh, called a representative mythological or ritualistic it has drawn considerable attention recently it is based on infinite simul textual details because the critic has to demonstrate 
some basic cultural array of great meaning. It appealed to humanity in a work of literature. This approach reflects a strong interest in myth and the influence of Fraser and Jung. The Golden Va by Fraser appeared in 12 volumes. It is a monumental study of magic and religion tracing numerous myths and stereotypes to their prehistoric origins. Carl Gustav Jung formed a, a theory of collective conscious. The word collective conscious means civilized man preserved through or though unconsciously those pre-strict areas of knowledge which he articulated obliquely in primitive myths. The concept of archetypal criticism is explained by M. H. Abraham in terms of its employed use in literary criticism ever since the appearance of archetypal patterns in poetry by Maud Borkin. The use of archetype in criticism is done in narrative designs, character types or images. The analogy with these uh, diverse phenomena is held to reflect a set of universal primitive and elemental patterns whose effective embodiment in a literary work evokes a profound response from the reader. The example of archetypal criticism is The Rim of the Ancient Mariner by S. T. Coleridge. It is the archetype of a spiritual journey which all men experience. The next one is sociological uh, criticism. Talking about sociological criticism, it is enjoyed much by the critics and especially it was become so much popular in 20th century. It regards a literary work as a product of social factors and ideologies. A French thinker Hippolyte Adolf Taine pronounced that literature is extremely influenced by the moment, the race and the milieu. It inspects literary work in the context of the social and historical conditions of its author. It means that all literary works are products of the times in which they are written. For example, The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway portrays the effect of war on the war. Veterans through various characters such as Jake Barnes. A work of art is examined in its social context and it also studies its social effects. Henry Levin rightly mentions the relation between literature and society are reciprocal. R -E -C -I -P -R -O -C -A -L. Literature is not only the effect of social causes, it is also the cause of social effect. Karl Marx also sees the value of literature in promoting social and economic revolution. Karl Marx contested that the way people think and behave in any society is determined by basic economic factors. He believed those groups of people who owned and controlled major industries. Literature uh, can affirm Greater changes that include the overthrow of the dominant capitalist ideology and the loss of power by those with money and privilege. As literature is not created in vacuum, the relation between the author and the society is elicited and always has a connection. This relation includes three basic factors. First, social status of the author, second, social content of a work, and third, the role of the audience in shaping the literature.
Edmund Wilson hints at sociological criticism in Vico's 18th century study of Homer's epics. This last one is textual criticism. Textual criticism is also called ontological criticism. Ontological. O n t o l o g i c a l. Yes, textual criticism is called ontological criticism. In textual criticism, the critic minutely analyzes the structure of a literary piece and various elements like words, images, diction, style, tone, and themes in work. Literary work. The critic ignores all extrinsic. The critic ignores all extrinsic factors uh, as biography, history, sociology, psychology. The ontological critic arrives at the true meaning of a work through such rigorous analysis. The new critic focuses only on the text. Robert Payne Warren made a statement that poetry does not inherit any particular element but it depends upon the set of relationships, the structure which we call the poem. Textual criticism provides ideologies for the scholarly editing of the text of cultural heritage. At first, it was meant to be the orientation of the manuscript and then repeat it in the domain of textual criticism in the classic. Textual criticism was legitimate for medieval vernacular text by Karl Lachemann and his followers. Textual criticism was also later adopted in biblical studies on the initial instance where rationalism questioned the belief that scripture was literally God-given and hence open up ways of understanding the historicity of the worlds of the Bible through scholarly textual analysis. So here, uh, here was uh, the types of criticism uh, which we have discussed. So in the next point, we will discuss about uh, some major writers uh, related with uh, literary criticism. There, I want to take a short little break. So here we will continue. Uh, so now we will talk about uh, the major critics uh, in the history of literary criticism. Firstly, we will talk about uh, Plato. And we know very well that Plato is one of the famous literary critics in the history of literary criticism. He was a classical thinker. He lived in the 4th century BC. He was a moral philosopher. He was a great disciple of Socrates. He was the first critic. He was examining poetry as a part of his moral philosophy. Um, there, find that he uh, his critical observations on poetry um, are found in the works such as the Iwan, Iwan, I O N, that the Symposium, or the Republic, and the Laws. So Plato denounced poetry on moral and philosophical grounds. His main aim was to induce moral values in society and seek the ultimate truth. For example, in his work The Republic, Plato depicts the value of justice and good actions, thus giving a didactic and moral lesson to the readers. The basic two questions that Plato asked first about any work of literature. First, does this work stand for ultimate truth? Second question is, does this work have a moral lesson that influences the readers? Plato's answers to these two questions are still disputed, yet the questions themselves have endured. For Plato, art can never be released from morality. And writers must serve the necessary ingredients for the education of the young. Plato believes that only an ideal work that offers 
a didactic end or a moral lesson should be circulated among the readers in the laws uh, which is less rigid than the republic in it uh, plato instructs that a trustworthy committee must be set up to restrain or gain all types of evil literature his main uh, become the literary critics and this is the kind of uh, literary criticism that to occasionally practice in his uh, dialogues uh, ahead we can uh, say that socrates was plato's teacher he appears as a protagonist in plato's earlier dialogues and his most important work titled the republic a plato's work dialogue portrays socrates protecting himself against the accusation of the state the republic by plato is based on ethics it touches upon metaphysics aesthetic and epistemology this is the next writer uh, uh, who is aristotle so we will discuss about uh, him now aristotle so talking about aristotle uh, he is the disciple or student of plato we know very well yeah. so in the classical age of literary criticism aristotle is the second most important figure in uh, literary criticism after plato his views were carried over by john dryden and john dryden also viewed in three unities uh, presented by aristotle those three unities are unity of action and unity of place third unity of time we have already said that aristotle is a student of plato he was a greek philosopher he lived from 384 bc before bc means before christ to 322 bc plato certainly could not get over from his intellectual intellectual revulsion for the world of appearances which is apparently the real world in contrast aristotle also investigated areas of philosophy and fields of science that plato did not consider among his criti critical treatises there are two which are most important first poetics by aristotle rhetoric by aristotle poetics deals with art of poetry and rhetoric deals with art of speaking poetry uh, poetics is a short book of 50 pages it contains 26 small chapters the initial four chapters and 25th chapter address poetry the Fifth chapter deals with comedy, epic, and tragedy. Following fourteen chapters are dedicated to tragedy, and next three to poetic diction, and next two chapters deals with epic, and the last one chapter makes a distinction between epic and tragedy. So, in the work Poetics, Aristotle outlines the meaning of tragedy, Tarsis, the tragic hero, and the three unities. such as time place and action aristotle spoke extensively on poetic drama tragedy and he critically analyzes oedipus the king by sophocles aristotle analyzes his play in order to explain these the terms such as plot character thought language spectacle tragic hero the three unities amarsia or a fatal fatal flaw according to plato and aristotle the tragic hero has to be noble he should be glorified like oedipus so ahead uh, talking about aristotle defends imitation as an aesthetic term here aristotle replies to plato's theory aristotle retaliated to the charges made by plato against poetry in the form of art plato remarks that 
uh, art being an imitation of the actual is removed from the truth as it only gives fondness of a thing in concrete and this fondness or liking is always less than real but plato fails to comprehend that art also gives something more which is absent in reality literature is not the exact reproduction of life in all its totality but of selected events and characters essential in a coherent action for the realization of the artistic purpose an artist elevates idealizes and creates an imaginative space a world which has its own meaning and beauty according to aristotle these elements are absent in raw and real but present in art an artist or poet puts forward the idea of reality which he observes in an object plato repeatedly negates art as it does not produce virtue and does, it does not impart any moral teachings the main aim or objective of art is to provide aesthetic joy communicate experience connections and emotions between nature and mankind in order to represent life it should not be confused with the function of ethics that is didactic in its purpose therefore if an artist succeeds in pleasing us with aesthetic logic he is a good artist but if they fail he is a bad artist this shows plato apparently patronized the artist in this defense r a scott observes and gives his inference on this condensation that morality teaches but art or artistic work does not attempt to teach but it merely uh, pursues life as it is plato's indictment on needless lamentation and ecstasy produced by the imaginary events of grief and happiness appeal to the weaker part of the soul and torpify the faculty of reason and these charges are walled by aristotle in his uh, work title theory of catharsis this is one of the point that the views of aristotle on tragedy according to aristotle a verse cannot be considered poetry as it is not imaginative or literary in general even a scientific observation is written in verse but that does not make it poetry so here aristotle distinguishes various forms of art on the basis of an object medium and manner of their imitation of life talking about a first point that is a object the form or genre of literature is decided on the basis of the object being imitated for example the portrayal of the life of great people is imitative in nature it makes the work a tragedy however when the life of meager people is imitated it will make a work of the trivial or comic subject thus tragedy deals with men on a heroic or glorified scale the next point medium like musicians use sound to convey a lyrical song and painters use colors to depict a painting similarly a poet uses words as the medium to express the feelings in the life of man manner the imitation of life depends on the manner of presentation that distinguishes literature from one another drama is always uh, presented in action while 
uh, epic is always presented in narration thus literature is determined on the basis of the technique employed now there we find the definition of tragedy given by aristotle aristotle says tragedy then is an imitation of an action that is serious and complete and of a certain magnitude in the language embellished with each kind of artistic ornament the several kinds being found in several parts of the play in the form of action not of narrative to pity and fear affecting the proper purgation and catharsis of these and similar emotions and this de uh, definition of tragedy explain uh, ahead according to points but we have already uh, here discuss but we must uh, uh, we must discuss about uh, aristotle theory of catharsis 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 emerges as a function of tragedy it is the filtration and purgation of emotions particularly pity and fear through art or any ultimate emotion that results in rejuvenation or restoration catharsis is a metaphor for true tragedy according to aristotle catharsis describes the effect of tragedy on spectators the important tragic effect depends on maintaining an alliance between pity and fear according to aristotle pity alone should not be induced by tragedy the word catharsis has three meaning first from a religious point of view it is a lustration second in the medical or pathological sense it is purgation and last one in moral sense it deals with the idea of purification the effect of catharsis is described by the ethical interpretation of tragedy where the lighting up of the soul in a tragic process results in a more philosophical attitude towards life and suffering the spectator sees the enduring process the largeness of disaster presented on stage and realizes that his personal emotions are trivial when compared to such a cataclysm or misfortune the purgation of such emotion makes them relieved and with this experience they come out as better human beings than they were in other words theory of catharsis plays both moral and vital function the impact of aristotle's work on physical sciences spreads far and wide offering well thought of theory and reasoning that would prevail for many years to come before eventually being replaced by modern physics at the age of 18 aristotle was a pupil of plato he further moved to educate at plato's academy where he stayed nearly for 20 years aristotle was an organic historian as he recorded data and analyzed the sea life around areas such as lesbos and his observations were ahead of his time this is the next writer who is uh, longinus talking about longinus he is uh, also called pseudo longinus he believed to be the author of on the sublime he wrote the greatest work on the sublime this treatise this work throws light upon certain examples of good and bad writing yes before longinus critics believed that poetry was persuasive and the function of poetry was to delight or give instructions whereas prose served both the purposes transgressing the existing claims longinus believed that the aim of Uh, or the objective of great work of art is to transport the reader out of himself 
poetry has an ecstatic nature that moves the reader to divine joy and hence this phenomenon is called sublime longinus believed in the transcendental power of poetry according to him a work of art achieves excellence only when it has the power to subli sublimate for longinus uh, sublimity is elevation or loftiness or certain distinction and excellence in composition so talking about the life of longinus uh, uh, he is believed to be cassius longinus of palmyra yes so there was but uh, we find uh, uh, that uh, his work especially yes his work especially on the sublime is most important so we must talk about it so uh, on the sublime's original title uh, is uh, peri hapsaus peri p e r i hapsaus h u p s a u s on the sublime is the full title yes so it is translated on the sublime yes it is translated into english as uh, the title is such as elevated writing by wordsworth on the severed uh, on the severin perfection of writing by arthur quiller coach a treatise on elegant living by pultini elevation of language by allen tate uh and uh, commonly it called on the sublime so these this work by longinus is translated by various writers such as wordsworth arthur quiller uh, pult uh, pultini alentate so in it longinus addresses his friend terentianus t e r e n t i a w n u s at the inception of the treatise and tells him the purpose of writing this treatise in order to correct the blunders made by cassilius in his essay on the sublime where the main object stands unheeded on periphery and other important observations are disclosed but not the main purpose according to longinus sublimity is a certain loftiness and excellence of language sublimity is the power to provoke ecstasy in the readers longinus believes that writers should be able to produce ecstasy in readers a sublime passage can be heard again and again with equal pleasure the primary function of literature is sacramental and the truly sublime as an elevating effect this is a point related with the sublime art can instruct sublimity yes really art can instruct or expound sublimity longinus focuses on the literature of power which is distinguished from the literature of knowledge the purpose of literature of power is to inspire and this purpose is not achieved by arguments but by exposures or revelations literature should not act as propaganda or be a source of entertainment instead it should provide a sense of vision there we can talk about the adverse uh, adversaries of the sublime the drawbacks in the writer's style are the enemies of the sublime these shortcomings include elements such as vagueness triviality uh, grandiloquence and most importantly frigidity when a writer attains frigidity while they try to elaborate something uncommon or attractive they drift and deviate the main source of all these shortcomings is the lure for innovative ideas there are uh, so some true and false sublime in the literary work Bombasting a timid language gives an indication of false sublime, whereas true sublime always elevates the soul of the listener. Longinus says that 
false sublime is evil the false sublime is attributed to immaturity it includes parade and pomp language lofty and diction it is used by writer on the other hand true sublimity remains free from lofty ideas and lofty diction true sublime pleases the readers for it expresses universally validated thoughts which are common to a man of all ages epoch and centuries false sublimity is showy and it cloaks the hollowness it contains and the essence of such language is time bound and the interest ceases over time on the contrary true sublime lifts us to a new realm and new experience each time true sublime is magic and it creates a permanent spell true sublime does not function on the power of discursive reason but works by intuition and insights there are some features of the sublimity we must uh, just uh, highlight it such as grand consumptions strong passion and persuasive emotions noble diction dignified and elevated composition amplification imitations these are the uh, these are the characteristic or properties of sublime and especially the 18th century saw the golden age of longinus the five sources of great writing are uh, vigor nobility of mind powerful emotion skill in the use of figures and diction in the history of greek literature moses had as remarks longinus tries to define true grandeur in literature uh, as the opposed to sophomoric turgidity uh, and frigid pretentiousness longinus says greatness in literature comes from the search for an ecstasy this is the next writer uh, who is samuel taylor coleridge i didn't uh, press card here but we must uh, can say that yes samuel taylor will reach so it is not it is not discovered here one minute one minute so uh, samuel taylor will reach we must discuss about him st coldridge yes miss samuel taylor coldridge talking about st coldridge uh, he uh, was an english poet literary critic philosopher and theologian and scholar uh, he wrote uh, the great work with the the companion of william wordsworth and uh, both william wordsworth and st coldridge organized the romantic movement in england uh, coldridge belonged to the category of lake poets he worked in collaboration with charles lamb robert sote charles lloyd uh, he composed the poems the rim of the ancient mariner kubla khan and uh, he also wrote an autobiography autobiography which title is biographia literaria and uh, uh, particularly on william shakespeare his basic work was exceptionally compelling he acquainted german visionary ways of thinking with english talking society coleridge coin phrase uh, suspension of disbelief and uh, it is also known suspension of disbelief uh, is also known for using the philosophy of transcendentalism in his work uh, coleridge's kinship with william wordsworth brought about the creation of lyrical ballads in 1798 uh, uh, there is a one famous critic uh, walter patter who called the period from 1797 to 1798 annus mirabilis or the wonderful years of coleridge's poetical career uh, because in this uh, time uh, coleridge was produced his greatest work in 1798 uh, coleridge went to germany he learned about transcendentalism 
and uh, later he used these in his works such as Kubla Khan. Uh, after coming back in England in 1799, uh, Coleridge attempted journalism and lecturing. Coleridge depicted himself as indolence capable of energies, though he was a remarkable genius who lacked willpower. In addition, Coleridge was dependent on opium and in an opium-induced state, he wrote uh, Kubla Khan. Uh, so there can come the question in our mind, why was Coleridge a prominent figure in literary theory and imagination? But uh, if we try to answer uh, on this question, so apart from his practical criticism, S.T. Coleridge established himself as a vital figure in literary theory uh, and analysis because Coleridge followed his own intellectual bent painful ex uh, existential crisis and assimilation of ethics of German philosophy meditatively. Uh, as a theorist, uh, Coleridge intensively noted the marginalia, lecture uh, published works, especially in his Biographia Literaria and studies of Shakespeare, covering various topics such as nature of mind, imagination and fancy the choice of words and their effect on the creative mind. The Romantic era in English literature focused on nature, imagination, fancy. Uh, so they are uh, talking about the origination of the imagination of the Romantic critics. So here we can say that the critics of Romanticism are thought of the creative mind as mixing and binding together of the intensity, the mind, which empowered the poet see inner connections, the identity of truth and beauty. Wordsworth uh, cited that the meaning of poetry runs uh, such as uh, in the poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility. Coleridge could just substitute tranquility by absenting. Wordsworth also remarks that the poets have each his own peculiar faculty, a uh, heaven gift, a sense that uh, fits him to pursue objects unseen before. And uh, there uh, ahead we find his work by S.T. Coleridge, which title is Biographia Literaria. It was published in 1817. It is an autobiography in discourse, it is a meditative autobiography. Uh, not a straightforward or linear autobiography. Uh, it ranges from autobiography to memoir, philosophy, religion, which in turn were heavily influenced by the German philosophy. Uh, in this work, uh, uh, Coleridge called creative mind the forming and changing power, while fancy as collective and composite power. For example, Coleridge makes his distinction clear when he remarked that Milton had a highly imaginative mind and Cowley a very fanciful one. Uh, there is a concept of imagination and fancy by Coleridge. So according to Coleridge, the difference between fancy and imagination is the same as the difference between mechanical mixture and chemical mixture. Means uh, fancy is a a mechanical mixture, imagination is a chemical mixture. According to Coleridge, imagination is the faculty associated with creativity and the power to shape and unify. Fancy uh, is merely associative, yes, fancy and imagination were wild, widely difficult faculties instead of according to the general belief either two names with one meaning or at furthest the lower and the higher degree of one and the same power and uh, your Coleridge uses the expression fancy in light of the 18th century perspective on imagination which was basically mechanical uh, and controlled by the law of association so there are two kinds of imagination presented by Coleridge First one, primary imagination, 
second one secondary imagination the primary imagination is the fundamental power of basic human power it enables us to identify discriminate synthesize uh, uh, it produces order out or disorder in this it is similar to the eternal act of creation in the infinite uh, um, primary imagination it is merely the power of receiving impressions of the external world to the senses it perceives objects both in their parts and as a whole the secondary imagination is at the root of all poetic activity but even though there must appear the question what is the difference between imagination and fancy so in chapter 13 of biographia literaria st coldridge discusses the, the, the difference between imagination and fancy according to coldridge imagination is poetic faculty uh, it gives shape to a given world but builds a new world whereas fancy applies the logical faculty fancy is the mechanical ability as the poet has to use devices like metaphors and alliterations in poetry in order to blend various ingredients into beautiful images so mm. coldridge considered language to the amor of human mind and it contains trophies of the past and weapons of its future conquest so there is a next writer whose the name is uh, sir philip sydney we must discuss him he is a little bit short book there is the next uh, writer who is sir philip uh, sydney we will talk about uh, him so sir philip sydney was uh, the eldest son of sir henry uh, and uh, uh, he was the nephew of robert dudley yes uh, sydney initiated his education from shrewsbury school and uh, it, uh, we find uh, that uh, mm, sydney wrote uh, the most important work uh apology for poetry and arcadia so, so on another thing that he invented the notion of four conceit which means that the conception or the idea of work that the poet writes pre exist in his mind before it is written philis sydney defends poetry in his essay an apology for poetry uh he invented the name pamela which appears in his elaborated prose work arcadia so sydney's arcadia assisted in changing our view on english countryside as old arcadia was rediscovered in the 20th century and the new arcadia uh, which was unfinished prose uh, it went through several changes in edition in 16th and 17th century and uh, his famous work is an apology for poetry we will discuss about it it is one of the best uh, uh, literary work in criticism and uh, uh, talking about it uh, it is the uh, it is the greatest work so in it sydney has communicated his supposition on different angles uh, he has carried poetry to its place sydney sets out to restore poetry to its rightful place among the arts during the 16th century lyrics and poems were written in abundance so there was an urgency to develop a proper poetic theory uh, the puritans were against the idea of poetry the most astonishing attack was of uh, gossen through various articles and pamphlets to which sydney gave a riposte uh, in apology for poetry uh, stephen gossen called the poets pipers p i p e r s or gestures j e s t e r s and he also says poetry is uh, miss stephen gossen says poetry is uh, as enemy of good virtue but city replies to uh, stephen gossens and uh, uh, 
here Sydney uh, says drama excited popular debauchery because male and female roles were juxtaposed. Sydney's answer in apology for poetry was praised by best writers of the day. Sydney played um, his undertaking most productively in light of the fact that he himself was a writer. He had enormous information on the works of art. The first thing Sydney progresses towards in defense of poetry, um, which is a re which is its relic and comprehensive or universality. Uh, Sydney defends poetry by writing that even the earliest Greek philosophers and historians were fundamentally poets. Sydney remembers all imaginative literature in poetry. He says, versing and rhyming don't make a poet. Here, Sydney truly holds the fundamental issue of the day. At first, Sydney concurs with Plato that poetry is a divine blessing um, after effect of motivation. Uh, in more than one spot, Sydney certifies the working of the celestial breath. Um, Sydney agrees with Aristotle and he says, verse is a craft of impersonation for so Aristotle termeth it. Along these lines, poetry is not just an art of imitation. The most critical is his revelation that one might be a poet without, without versing. Sidney gives a stage forward to Aristotle in his meaning of poetry. Sidney said that creative mind is an inventive cycle. Uh, the poet does not just duplicate, uh, rather uh, he uh, or she additionally changes the genial and the real and in, in this way endures. Uh, the poet gives birth to a new creation altogether. However, the creation of a poet is not fully imaginative but also it consists of reality. Uh, thus, poetry embodies universal value. Uh, Sydney writes, it is the highest and noblest. Uh, Sydney emphasizes that the poet is a divine figure who creates an ideal world. Sydney has placed the uh, Stephen Gosson's charges into four uh, categories. First, a man could use his time more useful than in poetry. Second, poetry is the mother of lies. Third, poetry is immoral and a nurse of abuse. Four, Plato rightly banished poets from his ideal commonwealth. Uh, guarding poetry against the principal charge, Sydney, Sydney says that man cannot utilize his time more conveniently than in poetry. Sydney comments, no learning is so acceptable as that uh, reacheth and moveth to virtue and that none can both show idols and thereto as much as poet. In his response to the second protest that artists are liars, Sydney says that of all writers under the sun, the poet is the least liar. The poet makes something by filling our creative mind against, against which no change of lying can be brought. The space experts, the geometrician, the uh, history specialist and others all offer bogus expressions. In any case, a writer nothing certifies and consequently never lieth. His objective being to tell not what is or what is not, but rather what ought to or ought not to be. The subject or truth or misrepresentation would emerge just when an individual demands reality. The poet does not present certainty but fiction typifying reality of an ideal kind. The third complaint against verse is the attendant 
misuse contaminating us with numerous pestilent desire of wits might be somewhat advocated however for this uh, specific artist might be accused but not worse to this charge sydney answers that worse does not mishandle man's mind however it is man's mind that man handles worse all expressions and sciences abused uh, had underhanded impacts yet that did not imply that they were less significant when appropriately utilized maltreatment of poetry yes sydney says maltreatment of poetry is not the issue of poetry however of the poet the fourth complaint that plato had banished the poets from his idiot republic is likewise not valid as plato tried to out to out the amoral poets of his time and not poetry itself plato himself accepted that poetry is supernaturally propelled in ion ion plato gives high divine tribute to poetry his depiction of the poet as a light winged and scared thing throws light upon his attitude towards poetry sydney concluded so as plato banishing the abuse not the thing not banishing it yet giving due honor unto it shall be our patron and not adversary uh, sydney comments that a large portion of such poems were composed of acquired and expanding phrases in exactly hung together in inadequate in view of their need for certified power and feeling the conspicuous reference here is to the servile imitation of the plutarch convention and customs yet astoundingly enough sydney himself was not liberated from it those poems are of the idea of artistic exercise there is no expression there is no expression of genuine enthusiasm yes except uh, for assessments whimsical and unbelievable here sydney descent against faulty in the poetry is of extraordinary importance there is the next writer uh, who is horas so we must also discuss about his uh, contribution for literary criticism Uh, uh he was born uh, in venice italy he was an exceptional latin lyric poet a satirist in the reign of emperor augustus he uh, he also managed to send horace he, his father also managed to send horace to rome for his studies after receiving education from the capital horace went to athens where he attended lectures at the academy He studied philosophy after Julius uh, Caesar's assassination on March forty-four BC. There was a political impasse in the Eastern Empire. Athens came into possession of his assassins, and uh, Horace profoundly studied Greek literature, Greek verses, Greek iambics, and Greek lyrics. Elegiacs. After after the. Um, Uh, after that uh, talking about his literary work literary uh, work means literary thoughts especially based on criticism so horas is a literary critic he holds an imposing position because of his uh, exuberant quality poet his earnest priority was uh, to find at rome patronizing poetry serviceable to the state uh, or has provided this perception of poetry in the light of awakening of patriotic feeling in the masses of the augustan era or has gave his insight on the people that though they were new in iv but they unlearned and learned alike they tried their hands on writing poetry the vital function of the poet is to delight 
and instruct the reader at the same time uh, who has believed that great poetry must have a dual role a sign which is to give pleasure and enhance the morals of mankind indeed Horace has much to direct the writers of poetry from epistola it tonus aspiring poets can to learn principles of test and technique to improve their work their uh, horas did the exigencies and purpose of the poet apart from the perception of beauty horas sees the poet composite entity who draws from experiences and con uh, horas conveys these in form of a uh, language which in turn affects the uh, listeners onto the beauty he feels the experiences which have steered him into a language uh, the primary qualification of a poet is the wisdom which he, the poet has attained two words that means cleverness or wisdom appear frequently at the end of uh, the work by horace which title is ars poetica so ars poetica he, uh, was once wisdom so according to horace uh, literature should be a tool to achieve this noble aim um, of wisdom and justice because in contemporary period vices uh, vices vices such as prejudices pedantry and the false standards uh, so these vices were going to on unchecked all around and therefore the task of the poet became double serious and significant he also talks about what is the aim of poetry is literature in literary criticism poetry means literature just to according to horace uh, poetry is a pure and uh, the pure or oral pleasure does not suffice the aim of poetry as some right thoughts about human behavior are also much needed horas reinforces the fact that thinking and communication of thoughts uh, is not the main essence of poetry a poet is born to pleasure the spirit the audience of great taste and a poet should not entertain those who gap at fantasies in ars poetica uh, horace defines the aim of poetry the aim of poetry is horace says the aim of poetry is either to be beneficial or to delight or in their phrases to combine charm and high applicability to life the invented notion thus should not be pleasure seeking but must address itself to the truth uh, this is the definition given by horas about uh, um, poetry uh, according to uh, uh, this definition that poetry should both teach and delight Uh, there is the poetry is a convocation of fiction and facts is one of the sentence or statement by horace poetry is a convocation of fiction and facts uh, so here poet uh, horace regards poetry to be a mode of imit but it is not just mere imitation only horace exclaimed that poetry often mingles with fancy putting on something of his own uh he did not like too much fancy on the part of the poet uh he added fiction composed to please should be very near to uh, to the truth uh, uh there is a formation of concept of poetry so in his conception of poetry horace is more platonic than aristotelian uh, for horace every poet shares in some minor way the miraculous charm of orpheus and apollo every poet calms the unruly herd uh, every poet uh, builds the fragile walls of a dream by his song whereas does not differ from classical thinkers and other critics 
as all of them believed in that without inspiration there is no poetry they too banished poets from the commonwealth because of fear of disconcerting influence uh, plato banished them because they produced the wrong sort of poetry uh, whereas views spark the controversy between form and content he seems to be inclined towards uh, the latter poets desire either to improve or to please or to unite the agreeable and profitable any moral must be brief so that the mind may readily pursue and faithfully retain a pithy sentence redundant words uh, overflow from a stated mind a fiction composed to please should be very near to the truth so that the play may demand unlimited belief uh, where, uh, here uh, eight uh, horas uh, restates uh, the emotional appeal of poetry uh, horas affirms that poets have always played the part of teachers effectively in ancient time it was the poet who exercised the moralizing and civilizing influence upon the barbarians horas remarks that it was not enough for the poems to have beauty as they must also be pleasing guide the listener's soul where the soul wishes to following this philosophy of his horas takes the view of poet's mission manner which is partly romantic and partly classical to represent his point that poets are moral educators horas refers to fans great poet singers fans great poet and singers tamed the brutes of the forest with their poetry they, uh, they civilized even the ferocious tigers and lions the ampion ampion is there ampion uh, was uh, capable of moving even rocks with his songs In this way poets were discharging their responsibilities of teaching horas hence authenticates this aristotelian part of the passionate pure of poetry according to horas a poet should be cautious in his choice of words uh, there must be a selective diction the analogy of familiar words can be added without baffling and padding uh, whereas can invent new words but advantage will be given to those newly coined uh, words that uh, originated from a greek source talking about uh, as uh, so he, uh, his first published works were often satires and this established him as a great poetic Uh, expert of Augustan age is uh, this one. Horace has con in this way. Horace has uh, contributed for literary criticism. There is the next writer, John Dryden. We must talk about uh, him. Yes, to be sure. so uh, in literary criticism we will discuss about john dryden now so dryden was born in the town of aldwickle a l d w i n c l e close to uh, thapstone in northamptonshire and there his maternal grandfather was a minister in 1644 he was shipped of westminster school as a king's scholar where his dean was uh, uh, dr richard busby busby after being reestablished by elizabethan first uh, westminster during this period grasped a totally different strict and political soul empowering traditionalism and high anglicanism His years at Westminster were not unremarkable, and his previously distributed poetry, an elegy with a solid traditionalist 
fell on the demise of his classmate Henry Lord Hastings from smallpox initiates the execution of King Charles I. Okay. Uh, so getting back to London during the Protectorate, Dryden acquired work with Oliver Cromwell's Secretary of State John Rolloy at Cromwell's Memorial Service on 23rd November 1658. Dryden prepared with the Puritan poets John Milton and Andrew Marvel. Dryden distributed his first significant poetry. Eric Stanzas in 1659. Uh, in 1660, Dryden praised the restoration of the government and the arrival of Charles II with Astrea Redux. And uh, there is uh, Dryden's one of the best literary work in the in the field of criticism, which title is an essay on dramatic poesy. Okay, so you must discuss. An essay of dramatic poesy uh, use an unequal record um, of neoclassical theory of craftsmanship as a tool. We are talking about uh, Religio Lysi by Dryden was a nominal defense of the authority of the English church was in effect a satire on unreason of all who Presented. Dryden was a dominating person and the whole age was known as the age of Dryden. The original title of an essay on dramatic poesy was of dramatic poesy and essay. Yes, and that's why an essay of dramatic poesy is one of the crafts. The, uh, it is one of the greatest craft uh, created by John Dryden. Dryden is a neoclassical critic. He bargains in his analysis with issues of structure and profound quality in show. In any case, Dryden is not a standard bound critic. He secured to the old style solidarities or to ideas of what establishes a legitimate character for the stage. Dryden, depend, and Dryden depends intensely on Cornelia and through him on Horace, which places him in a logical convention. Dryden composed his article, uh, an essay of dramatic poesy. So, Dryden composed this article as a sensational dialogue with four characters. First is Ingenious, E U G E N I U S. Second, Kites. C R I T S. Third, Decidious. L I S I D E I U S. And fourth one is Neander. N E A N D E R. So these are four characters. And uh, here they discusses about uh, the different types of drama such as French, more uh, modern uh, English. And these are four basic positions manage five issues. Uh, your engineers of favors moderns over the people of your why who are you? Containing that the moderns surpass the people of your the result of having taken in and uh, benefited from their model. Rights defense ancient drama. The ancients uh, cling to the solidarities and guidelines explained by Aristotle. Mm, these uh, solidarities and guidelines, the current uh, and French writers followed actually. And uh, Ben Johnson, the best English dramatist, said by the Christ. So Ben Johnson, the great uh, dramatist, cling to the solidarities. Decidious contends that French dramatization is better than English show. It bases its assessment of the French or nearby adherence to the old style detachment of parody and misfortune. Decidious defends French drama. Uh, he retaliates 
द फंक्शनिंग ऑफ इंग्लिश ड्रामा आफ्टर जॉनसन ब्यूमॉन्ट एंड फ्लेचर कमेंट्स नो परफॉर्मेंस सेंटर ऑन द प्लानिट हैज एनीथिंग टू रिडिक्यूलॉस एज द इंग्लिश ड्रामा इन टू अवर्स एंड हाल्फ वी गो थ्रू ऑल द अटैक्स ऑफ बेडलैम नियंडर फेवर्स द मॉडर्न्स यट does not discourage the people of your neander asserts that we have invented increased affected a more pleasant way of writing for the stage such come neander condemns french dra dramatization basically for its diminutiveness d i m i n u t i v e n e w s and its quest for just one plot without subplot its inclination to show too little activity its subservient perceptions of the solidarities shortage of plot and restriction of creative mind are generally characteristics which render it substandard compared to english dramatization neander expands his analysis of french dramatization he favors shakespeare over ben jonson owing to the universality in the former's works shakespeare had the largest and most comprehensive soul while jonson was the most learned student essayist which any performance center ever had ultimately neander inclines towards shakespeare for his more noteworthy tension is more prominent loyalty to life when contrasted with johnson's generally little degree and french classical propensity to bargain the beauties of a statue but not of a man writes object to rhyme in plays since no man without intention talks in rhyme neither should he to do it on the stage he refers to aristotle as saying that it may be best to write tragedy in that kind of poetry despite the fact that clear stanza lines are not any more unconstructed than rhymed lines they are still to be favored in light of the fact that they just are closed nature neander reacts to the complaints against rhyme by considering that stanza so dull is wrong to show regular rhymed refrain is nonetheless proper to emotional as to non sensational poetry the trial of the effortlessness of rhyme is the manner by which very much picked the rhymes are Uh, is the filling of the reference secured to and restricted by the rhymes or are the rhymes in support of and uh, an upgrade of the filling of the stanza the main aim of dryden's work was to compare and comment on different forms of stanza his different forms of stanza hold hold a very significant place in english criticism dryden is rigid in nature he characterizes sensational craftsmanship as an impersonation he is viewed as an equitable in ex brand picture of human instinct in this way dryden has presented next one is a william wood the great So William Wordsworth uh, who uh, devoted himself for the development of English literature. He was one of the best author in, in English Romanticism. He was the most uh, focal figure and significant brain in literary field. He writes on childhood, role of the child, beauty of nature, 
he believes that the language of poetry should be simple and rustic child uh, mm, so talking about uh, him uh, wordsworth wrote uh, the most popular work lyrical ballads with uh, samuel taylor coleridge so that he also wrote the prelude the prelude is a romantic epic poetry that gives the temporal sequence of the development of a poet's brain it will find that uh, the year uh, 1797 uh, and 1800 is the most important was uh, in this year in the 1798 wordsworth uh, and coleridge published preface to lyrical ballads uh, preface to lyrical ballads marks the beginning of the romantic age in english literature uh this uh, genesis the it is called the genesis of the romantic age uh, during 1798 wordsworth additionally dealt with a bit of composition setting out his developing thoughts on equity and ethical quality and uh, here uh, we want to talk about the theory of poetic diction presented by wordsworth so here wordsworth uh, was against the lofty language and diction of the 18th century poets for example dryden wordsworth believed that the language of poetry should be simple the language of poetry must be gained by the common man wordsworth believed that most of those who enjoyed consideration in society were incapable of love to man or reverence for god wordsworth would not write to please a corrupt society he would not employ its language wordsworth would sing in simple language wordsworth theory of poetic diction is not mere revolt against the existence practice the key idea presented by wordsworth where the language remember the language of poetry should be real language of man it should not have any artificiality about it i mean wordsworth made the rustic folk and humble people according to wordsworth the language should be purified it should not be the language of men in a state of vivid sensation the language of poetry is not essentially different from that of the poem it should be very simple it should understandable it should be noted that the language should be easy to understand the preface to lyrical ballad tells us that the poems were in the nature of an experiment he had brought them out with the purpose of ascertaining how far the language of conversation in the working classes society was worth objective was to deal with incident incidents and situations from common and rustic the personages of wordsworth's poem are drawn from the unassuming classes and the provincial life a similar unassuming and natural life is the wellspring of his language his purposes behind the decision of provincial life include uh, the language of poetry should be simple like rustic and simple men for wordsworth every one of these things are common gadget the language should fit the circumstances any use of words ought to be dodged for when the poet is talking in his voice and when he is talking through his cat meter 
should not be mistaken for idyllic style. It says that meter complies with specific standards. It defends the use of meter for various reasons. Goldrich further adds that it is not right to specify the best piece of our language we got from nature. Language is matter formed. There are theoretical things, ideas which are on a par with some other piece of language. These originate from the intelligent demonstrations of the brain. These ideas cannot be communicated through the language of rustics. Bullrich remarks, the language of rustics is inquisitively, inquisitively blank. It will return the clock. It will be retrogation. It will be retrogation. Right. Right. What's what uh, talks about a uh, uh, poet? Yes. Then he says, what is poet? So, Wordsworth says that uh, poet is a man addressing men. He enriched, uh, he is enriched with all the more energetic reasonableness, mineral energy, and delicacy. Uh, poet has a more prominent uh, information on human instinct. Uh, poet uh, must have a, a pure, pious soul. Uh, the poet should be normal among humankind. He should be a man with uh, satisfaction. He uh, he must uh, have cheered to the people uh, for that. Uh, he must be charmful personality. And uh, the poet uh, he is the stone safeguard for human instinct. He is an upholder and preserver. He conveys very well with his relationship and love. The poet uh, sings a tune in which all sympathetic creatures join him, be that as uh, it may, be that as it may, those interest and sentiments are the overall interest and considerations and sentiments of man, the virtue of human interest. The poet thinks and feels in the to summarize poet assembled together by interest and information in the tremendous realm of others conscious society uh, the poet will follow wheresoever the poet can uh, discover an environment of sensation uh, poetry is the first and finally information uh, there uh, is the uh, we find that uh, Coleridge has criticized Wordsworth theory of poetic diction. We hear Coleridge disagrees with Wordsworth regarding the statement that there neither is nor can be any essential uh, difference between the language of prose and metrical composition. Coleridge asserts that there is and there should to be an essential difference between the languages of prose argues that of poetry. Coleridge uh, argues that the experience of the provincial is restricted in terms of the current realities available to him and the exposure to society. So Coleridge cannot think intelli intelligently. Uh, he cannot uh, interface with realities and communicate sensibly as an informed man can. Examining Wordsworth theory of poetic diction, Coleridge maintains that the language of the rustic, purified and uh, purified from its defects and grossness, uh, the language of the rustic, uh, the uh, language of the rustic will not differ materially from the language of any other man of common sense, no matter how learned or re refined he is. Poetry is shaped by the use of proper science and images of the human creative mind and reflection which the uninformed man cannot have. Giving his basic appraisal of the language of prose and poetry as reflected in Wordsworth's theory of poetic.
friction voltage objects to the equivocalness um, in the use of the word genuine g e n u i n e Wordsworth believes that the language of poetry is the genuine language of men Coleridge contends that everybody's language differs as per the degree of his insight the exercises of his resources and the profundity and briskness of his emotions he calls attention to that the language used in the poetry of Wordsworth varies enormously from the language of a typical worker Coleridge further claims that there is a difference between the language of writing and the language of material creation he believes that there is and uh, there should be a fundamental contrast between the dialects of writing and poetry according to Coleridge the language of poetry clearly contrasts with that of normal discussion and prose this distinction emerges from the ways that poetry uses a meter and requires an alternate game plan of words Coleridge states that meter is not simple shallow beautification but meter is a fundamental and natural poetry in this way there must be there must be a basic contrast between the language of composition and that of poetry now uh, uh, next major critic is uh, uh, one is uh, well, Johnson, who is one of the major critic, is dropping history of literature and uh, talking about him. One put uh, the uh, two volumes of Dictionary of the English Language. Uh, for that, he also put the next work, Lives of the English Poets, and he also wrote eight volume edition of Shakespeare uh, Johnson's uh, prominent uh, poem is the vanity of human wishes the vanity of human wishes a thought on the emptiness of worldly pursuits uh, yeah uh, dr. Samuel Johnson is one of the important figure an integral dimension of Johnson's literary output and personality was his literary criticism his literary criticism had a huge influence on english letters johnson's prominent face r e f a c to the edition of shakespeare's plays played a vital part in expanding the boundaries of english criticism johnson's account of lives of numerous english poets was an appendage to the formation of the English literary canon and the defining of attributes. Johnson's critical insights were witty, sharp, provocative, radical, grounded on his massive range of uh, massive range of reading. Uh, Johnson analyzed uh, the best of Shakespeare's artwork. The so Shakespeare's artwork has given him supremacy over others because of the universality of Shakespeare's outlook. Shakespeare is in every case consistent with life. Shakespeare's characters are genuine people. Their discourses are genuine discourses. While different writers have disregarded livelihood, likelihood, and distorted life, Shakespeare has consistently kept up his devotion to life. Uh, Shakespeare's sins involve men who act and talk as the pursuer imagines that he would himself have spoken or followed up on a similar event. He confers human characteristics and human discourse in his works are the reflections of life Shakespeare disregarded standards Shakespeare composed with the world open before him according to Dr. Johnson 
Shakespeare portrays the good and bad aspects of life in his dramas. He mixes them in the tragic comedies. Tragic comedies are the reflections of real life. Shakespeare's dramas are neither un unadulterated comedies nor unadulterated misfortunes. However, Shakespeare's dramas have a structure of a particular kind. Uh, Johnson Shields drama, which is more consistent with life than the unadulterated misfortune or unadulterated parody. Dr. Samuel Johnson Shields Shakespeare's dismissal of solidarities. Uh, Shakespeare's uh, chronicles are neither misfortunes nor comedies. They are not dependent upon the laws of solidarities. Uh, no other solidarity is proposed, thus, none is to be looked for. In different plays, Shakespeare observes the solidarity of an activity. The plot of the dramas follow the Aristotelian example of a start, center, and an end. According to Johnson, Shakespeare understands the audience's mind and expectations. Shakespeare interchange seriousness and comedy by which the mind is softened at one time and exhilarated at other. Shakespeare makes his audience laugh and mourn at the same time. Shakespeare shows no respect for the solidarities of time and spot. Johnson also believes that it is not important to watch these solidarities. To observe, realize that the stage is just a phase and players just players. Dramatization is credited simply because it is only an image of a reality. Dramatization is similar to the real, but it is not the reality itself. Impersonation produces agony or delight, not on the grounds that they are confused with real factors, but since they carry real factors to mind. Johnson acclaims Shakespeare for his constancy to life, but Johnson does not challenge Shakespeare. Johnson not only praised Shakespeare, but also pointed out at his efficiencies like a true critic. Johnson's most noteworthy imperfection is that he forfeits, forfeits temperance to accommodation and is quite a lot more cautious to please than to train that he appears to compose with no ethical reason. Since Shakespeare disregards the chances of good guidance, he is inadmissible as an author. His statues and aphorisms drop calmly from him. He makes no, no only appropriation of good or wickedness, nor is consistent, consistently mindful so as to show in the upright a dissatisfaction with regards to the mischievous. Johnson argues that Shakespeare's characters do not belong to the society of a particular place or time. They are universal. They appeal to people of all kinds. This points at the universality of Shakespeare's plays. Johnson sees Shakespeare's misfortunes as second, uh, second rate as compared to his comedies. They are work things as he would see it. They do not have the suddenness and effortlessness of his comedies. The radiation of energy in them is generally striking and vivacious. Yet his efforts to develop something new and striking. The outcome is meanness, dullness and lack of clarity. 
Johnson is among the first of those critics who consider crafted by a creator according to the age to which he had a face. In preface, Johnson analyzes Shakespeare's plays according to the Elizabethan age. Johnson says, a creator's attempts to be profoundly judged must be contrasted and the phase of the age where he lived and with his own specific chances. The flavor of the individuals was rough and crude. Shakespeare's plays and dramas are packed with episodes since it was distinctly through occurrences and activity that he could hold the attention of his crowd. The Elizabethan crowd with its lacking taste could all the more likely acknowledge pageantries and parades which were obvious on the stage than the poetical language which made it appeal to the ear. As per Johnson, Shakespeare is a mixture of greatness and flaws. Subsequently, Johnson thinks that Shakespeare's uh, plays were not only flowers but also weeds and thorns to grow. Shakespeare's plays are true reflection of life and mankind. Uh, talking about the wickedness of Shakespeare, Shakespeare is uh, completely unique. Shakespeare built up the English drama and uh, Shakespeare carried e the English drama to the skirt of flawlessness in a singular scene. Uh, Johnson believed that Shakespeare uh, as a playwright appeals to everyone, to all the classes of people pointing to his uh, universality and genius. Considered as a unit, Johnson's assessment of the English poets have survived as what Arnold called natural centers. Um, Johnson points out of indicators to which criticism can repeatedly return. Though Johnson's criticism was based on the classical foundation of affinity to nature, reason and truth as well as moral um, instruction, what Johnson added was the need for historical contextualization of authors and their works and, and an obligation to place nature in a wide-ranging sense. It is worth remembering that by nature, Johnson does not mean primarily the world of external physical nature, but Johnson is presented human nature in its universal and past embodiment of reason and moral sensibility. In his in his essay on Milton, Johnson states that the knowledge required or included are not the great or the frequent business of the human mind. The first requisite is the religious and moral knowledge of right and wrong. The next is social contact with the history of mankind and with those examples which may be said to exemplify truth. Respectively, each one needs historical conceptualization and comparison and the appeal to nature and truth over convention where uh, Johnson anticipates and sets the stage for much romantic and modern criticism. Uh, Samuel Johnson wrote fictional work The History of Rasilas, written in a week to pay for a mother's funeral. Samuel Johnson wrote many periodical essays such as Rambler, The Adventurer and The Idler. Uh, Johnson's own biography was recorded by his friend James Boswell. His title is Life of Samuel Johnson. In one. Next, uh, Matthew Arnold, who is one of the important critics. Um, uh, Matthew Arnold is a very important critic. In the history of literary criticism, uh, he, Matthew Arnold established himself as a famous poet as well as critic, conveyed numerous important talks and translations. The most renowned of 
theme was at Oxford on translating Homer, Arnold's first volume of poetry, The Stray Traveller and other poems got published in 1849. This included poems like The Forsaken Merman and Sonnet to Shakespeare, Johnson's sensational poem Empedocles M on Etna showed up in 1852. Of like Sorab and some in the introduction to this volume, uh, Arnold proclaimed that the poetry written in incredible style must portray an activity. Activity is amazing and builds to the extraordinary essential fairness. Year 1888 marked. Open Liverpool on 15 April 1888, Arnold rushed to get a cable car with his better help and kicked the bucket a similar second. Now Arnold had gone to meet his senior little girl on her route home from the US. He said that it was a little unexpected that Arnold died of cardiac failure. Yes, Elliot appreciated. Arnold's objective approach, especially his tools of comparison and analysis, and Tate in his essay Tense in Poetry uh, imitates Arnold's stone method to discover tension or the correct balance between connotation and denotation in poetry. These new critics have made progress from the romantic approach to poetry, and this change in attitude could be attributed to Arnold who comes midway between the two schools. Arnold's assessment of the romantic poets such as Byron, Shelley, Kitts are a benchmark in descriptive criticism and as a poet critic he occupies an eminent position in the rich galaxy of poet critics English literature. Uh, in, in the work The Function of Criticism at the present time Arnold says that criticism should be dissemination of ideas, a disinterested endeavor to lure and propagate the best that is known and thought in the world. Arnold says that when accessing a work of literature, the aim is to see the object as in itself it really is. Psychological, historical, and sociological backgrounds are irrelevant. And to dwell on such aspects is mere uh, dil dilettantism. Dilettantism. This stance was very influential with later critics. Uh, there is presented the definition of critic uh, by Matthew Arnold, and we must discuss about uh, it. Mm, uh, according to Arnold, poetry is an application of ideas to life. Arnold believes that the ideas and sentiments to have any permanent value must be based on actual life. Thoughts and feelings excluded from the action might be the creed of a few poets. According to Arnold, poetry does not present life as is but the poet adds something from his normal nature. The poem connects its feeling to the thought. The thought is the reality. The most grounded aspect of the religion today is its obvious poetry. These expressions of Matthew Arnold put poem on an exceptionally high platform. Arnold predicts an extremely high fate for poem. According to Arnold, Poetry is the analysis of life. While making his own unique poetry, a poet must remove himself from the material world. He conceals the distortions and amplifies the excellent and he reveals into an analysis of life that helps an admirer of poetry to comprehend and relate to those shrouded delights of Life and nature. While occupied with the undertaking of censoring life, 
the poet works just under the commitment the poem is a workmanship and a craftsman fills the requirement for excellence for fulfilling the test fulfilling of man fundamentally poem makes the consciousness of joy in magnificence poem makes magnificence yes history is a record of what was poetry of what ought to have been history manages what has really occurred uh, clearly the use of these good thoughts or to life are to be applied both coherently it is to be a beautiful application arnold's optimal poet is someone who can apply wonderful thoughts of life arnold feels that the enormity of a writer lies in his ground breaking and lovely utilization of thoughts of life in his perspective the essential inquiry which a poet should answer is how to live genuine poetry consistently takes its ideas from real life situations the reassurance and stay will be of the intensity of the analysis of life the analysis of life will be of intensity in the extent of the poem passing on it as amazing as opposed to substandard arnold accepts that it is just a poem that is a sure and dependable guide in practically all divisions of human action as per arnold the best poetry is the thing that we need the best poetry will be found to have an intensity of framing continuing and charming us arnold believed that poetry does not present life as it is the poet adds something to it from his own noble nature this something contributes to his hypothesis analysis might be analysis of wordsworth works as arnold believes that wordsworth poem presents a sound analysis of life arnold says poetry should comfort and support us for arnold believes that poetry of wordsworth calms the soul it relieves tears of all worries wordsworth had been viewed by arnold as an incredible poet since he manages life and thoughts so intensely and genuinely for arnold wordsworth plays as a writer above poets like voltaire dryden pope lessing skiller in this manner wordsworth enormity as a writer lies in the substance of chaucer's poem his uh, percept uh, perspectives on things and his analysis of life has enormity opportunity insight kindness however it does not exhibit this high earnest it is this essentially which provides for our soul what they can settle upon with the expanding request of our advanced age upon poetry this ideals of giving us what we can settle upon will be increasingly more profoundly regarded is yes, eliot appreciated arnold's objective approach especially his tools of comparison and analysis allen hmm, yes. to hate we can say that allen tate yes. in his essay tensed in poetry imitates arnold's stone method to discover tension or the correct balance between connotation and denotation in poetry his new critics have made progress from the uh, romantic approach poetry and this change in attitude could be attributed arnold who comes midway between the two schools arnold's assessment of the roman poet such as byron shelley kits are benchmark in descriptive criticism and as a poet critic he occupies an eminent 
position in the rich galaxy of poet critics English literature. It is in his in Arnold's The Function of Criticism at the present time, Arnold says that criticism should be a dissemination of ideas. It is a disinterested endeavor to learn. It propagates the best that is known and thought in the world. Arnold says that when accessing a work of literature, the aim is to see the object as in itself it really is. Psychological, historical and sociological backgrounds are irrelevant and to dwell on such aspects is mere mm, dilettantism. Stans was very influential with letter critics. There is another uh, writer, critic T. Eliot. You must talk about him. T. S. Eliot is the full name is Thomas Stearns Eliot. And uh, he, he wrote a famous work such as Proof of and Other Observation, Ash Wednesday, Fragmented, Four Quartet on Poetry and Poets. His significant scholarly analysis is contained in selected essays. Yes, Eliot. Sensational corporate, The Rock, a, a Pigeon Play. Murder in the Cathedral, The Family Reunion, The Cocktail Party, The Confidential Clerk, The Elder Statesman. He was awarded both uh, the Order of Merit and the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1948. Uh, in chronological order, Eliot's critical works may be clubbed under the following categories. First, theoretical criticism dealing with the principles of literature. Second, Descriptive and practical criticism dealing with works or writers in particular. Third, and lastly, theological essays like Tradition and Individual Talent, one of the influential critical works. Tradition and Individual Talent was published under Sacred Wood in 1922. Then, it is included under Selected Essays. In this essay, Eliot primarily focuses on the following things. First, historical thought and tradition or convention. Second, interconnectedness and interdependence on past. Third, impersonality in art in general sense and especially poetry. So here is critical concept of T.S. Eliot. Talking about uh, T.S. Eliot critical concept, T.S. Eliot is the best critics in the 20th century. His uh, Eliot's critics denote an absolute break from the 19th century traditions and provide guidance on artistic analysis. The pearls of his basic ideas lie dissipated all through his roughly 500 essays and reviews. Mm. The term objective correlative was first used by T.S. Eliot in his article on Hamlet. Uh, uh, through the term, he depicts objects, situations, events that describe a particular emotion and feeling. For example, T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock is uh, one concept uh, 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 yellow smoke and yellow fog. Both are objective correlatives, uh, both portray the urban ennui, e -N -U -I, and absurdity of the modern world, it is an unoriginal or target method for conveying feelings. Eliot calls the object to correlate to the main method of communicating feeling as an art. He characterizes, characterizes it as a lot of articles, a circumstance, a chain of occasions which will be the recipe, uh, recipe of the specific feeling with the end object to that when the outer realities, which must end in tactile experience, are given, the feeling is promptly evoked. For example, in Macbeth, Eliot uses Lady Macbeth's state of mind as an example of the objective coordinative, particularly by the walking scene. A psychological anguish has been generalized as to be seen through eyes as felt by the heart. Consequently, the outer circumstance is adequate to inspire in the psyche of the pursuer the ideal feeling of the misery of women Macbeth. 
accordingly rather than imparting the feelings of melancholy straight forward to the persuader shakespeare has typified these feelings in the form of an event that effectively passes on the sentiment of misery to the persuader john keats has called the objective correlative as the negative capability to depict the objective uh, and impersonal parts of shakespeare uh, various uh, critics have deciphered the term objective correlative in an unexpected ways so uh, uh, hate uh, we find that uh, the expression is the expression dissociation of sensibility as its opposite unification of sensibility were first utilized by eliot in the essay on metaphysical poets in the mid 17th century in his analysis the connection between the mind and the feelings in craftsmanship and poetry is of central significance and the achievement of aesthetic execution of the writer a craftsman relies upon the power of his reasonableness as indicated by eliot a poetical accomplishment is only what might be compared to the idea as per t s eliot the unification of sensibility means the combination of thought or reason and feeling he believes that if a poet combines these two aspects then only he can write a successful work in contrast to unification is dissociation of sensibility which gives birth to awful poetry eliot finds the unification of sensibility in the metaphysical poets and laments the dissociation of reason and feeling in the late 17th century in in eliot's essay on the metaphysical artists Yes, Eliot educates us regarding the cycle of the combination of thoughts and feelings. Uh, and uh, ahead we find uh, he comments: Tennyson and uh, Browning are poets, and they think, yet they don't feel their idea as promptly as the scent of a rose. An idea to done was an encounter. it altered it altered his reasonableness at the point when an artist's brain is totally prepared for its work it is continually amalgamating unique encounters the standard man's experience is righteous sporadic and fragmentary eliot does not think of browning as an extraordinary artist because eliot believes that browning neglects to change his thoughts into feelings and sensations eliot accepts that a truly incredible artist has the patience to express and feel his idea uh, the amicable working of the imaginative and basic forces of a writer comprises another part of the unification of reasonableness as indicated by eliot thus as per eliot a writer must make as well as carry the basic capacity to work upon his creation mm, the writer should update and refine it uh, and give his creation a wonderful shape indicated by eliot it is important for a writer to be a critic to be able to interpret and judge in his essay on tradition distributed nice yes, on tradition Eliot argues that tradition is primary to the writers they must learn from the writers of the past and they use their appropriate ideas in the works eliot uh, now uh, uh, so in this way eliot uh, has uh, contributed himself for uh, criticism the next writer is i a richards yes uh i richards is a scholarly critic uh, who his full name is ivor armstrong richard and uh, he is the originator of the school of translation uh, known as uh, new criticism uh, 
Richards was conceived in Cheshire in 1893. He instructed at Cambridge University's Magdalen College. During his time as a teacher at Cambridge, Richards composed three of his most powerful works. First, Meaning of Meaning. Second, Principles of Literary Criticism. Third, Practical. Uh, alongside Charles K. Ogden, Richards like, uh, made an improved language called Basic English, which comprised essential terminology of 850 words. There are some major works by I. Richards. First, The Foundations of Aesthetics. Second, Principles of Literary Criticism. Next, Science and Poetry. Next, Practical Criticism. After that, Mencius on the Mind, Coldridge on Imagination, The Philosophy of Rhetoric, The Meaning of Meaning, Speculative Instruments, Beyond, Poetries, Complementaries. Uh, Richards uh, co-authored with C.K. Ogden and James Wood for the work The Foundations of Aesthetics. Uh, after that, Richards also co-authored with C.K. Ogden for the work The Meaning of Meaning. So there are some important work uh, which about we must talk. Uh, first work, The Principles of Literary Criticism. The Principles of Literary Criticism is written by I. A. Richards in 1924. It was developed as a close reason theory of the mind's response to rhythm and meter. Richards' theory is relative and pure. It based on the sound effects of prosody have a little psychological effect by themselves. It is prosody related to its contemporary Perennious different impacts. It delivers its trademark bend on our neural structures. Richards demanded that all that occurs in a poem release upon the natural environment. Next work is Practical Criticism. In the work Practical Criticism, I Richards came up with the idea of close reading of the text itself. Uh, in which the biographical details of the writer were least considered. Uh, Richards believes that the moment a critic or reader dwells in the details of the writer, the text dies. He eliminated the authorial and uh, relevant data from 13th uh, sonnets. Uh, to prove his idea, I. Richards asked his students at the University of Cambridge to interpret a poem. And the students came up with unique interpretations of the poem. What Richards believes is that the text has a life of its own. This is the next work by I. Richards, The Meaning of Meaning. Yeah. Meaning of Meaning is a work written in 1946 in collaboration with C.K. Odegan. Uh, this work is a fundamental work based on the 20th century passion for identifying connections between word and reference. At the core of this text is three-part semiotics. There are symbols, thought and references. Symbols are things like words and images or organ and Richard would say symbols are those signs which men use to communicate one with another and as instruments of thought and occupy a peculiar place. Reference are the ones existing in the external world like places, objects. The thought is representative of, the, of this part of the triangle where the brain connects reference symbols. A triangle with three focuses and three sides of symbols, thoughts and reference. Next literary critic Babbitt. Irving Babbitt is known for a literary movement known as Neo-Humanism. Humanism, Neo -humanism. Uh, in the work The New Lao Kun, uh, he criticizes the confusion prevalent in the art created by the Romantics. In the work On Being Creative, he compares the Romantic thought of impulsiveness 
with the classic theory of imitation. Irving Babbitt is an American scholar. He is a literary critic and he is uh, the head of the American New Humanist, which is a critical movement. Yes. He was considered the 19th century romantic movement to be a legitimate augmentation of Jean Jacques Rousseau's way of thinking of naturalism. According to J. David, uh, J. David, Babbitt's humanistic methodology ensured a dualistic point of view on human institution, arranging in it two opposing powers. From one viewpoint, human instinct has an intrinsically expressionist impulse that looks for discharge from all requirements and seeks after an inclusive freedom of will and creative mind. In any case, it additionally has a standard of control, power for order and balance. There are his first literature and college, second new Lao Kun, third masters modern French criticism, fourth Rousseau and romanticism, fifth democracy leadership in creative, seven the Dhammabad, 8th Spanish character and other essays, last one, representative two writings. There are other literary critics. F.R. Lewis. Uh, F.R. Lewis' full name is Frank Raymond Lewis. He was a British literary critic of the early to mid 20th century. He was an educator at Downing College. Cambridge. He uh, taught at the University of York also. He was a central figure in English criticism. He was associated with New English at Cambridge. A far reverse is placed along with the humanistic and moral convention of Matthew Arnold. Lewis Lewis, yes, Lewis, sorry. Lewis criticized the amateur practice of reading or writing essays primarily for their aesthetic effect known as Pelletrism, P E L L E T R I S M. Lewis went to Cambridge University and afterwards served all to World War I as a rescue vehicle carrier career on the Western Front. In 1932, with his better half, the previous Kinney, Q U W E N I E, Dorothy Roth, uh, who wrote um, the work Fiction and the Public. Yes. With the help of Pini, uh, Lewis established scrutiny. Pini is a periodical, quarterly journal, sorry, quarterly journal of critics. Scrutiny was founded in 1932 by LC Knight was distributed until 1953. It is viewed by numerous individuals as his most prominent commitment to English letters. Continually communicating his feelings with seriousness, Lewis accepted that writing uh, should to be uh, firmly identified with the analysis of life and that it is along these lines that a scholarly critic must evaluate works in the light of the author's and society's ethical position. Lewis shared with T. S. Eliot and new critics the idea of literary criticism should be a separate and grave discipline. Lewis reinforced that mainstream of English poetry flowed through John Donne, Alexander Pope, Samuel Johnson and T. S. Eliot. Uh, in his prominent work Revaluation, Tradition and Development in English Poetry to the 17th Century, F. R. Lewis analyzed English poetry going back to the 17th century. In his work The Great Tradition, Lewis reaccessed English fiction where he manifested that Jane Austen, George Eliot, Henry James, Joseph Conrad and D. H. Lawrence as the best writers as they promote awareness for the possibilities of life. 
The work embodies Levy's characteristically new critical rejection of styles of fiction that he uh, found lacking in moral intensity. Next critic uh, here, uh, who is critic William Emerson. Now we must uh, talk about uh, him. Yes, William Emerson. William Emerson is one of the uh, famous English literary critic uh, who is known for close reading of literary works. And the new criticism paid attention to the body of text still itself. Uh, we must believe that a text has a life of its own. Uh, Emerson was an associate at, associate at the New English Curriculum at the Cambridge University and a student of I. Richards. William Emerson was the student of I. Richards. Emerson himself was not a new critic but produced a book Seven Types of Ambiguity in 1930. Seven Types of Ambiguity had an influence on new criticism stressed on the nature of poetry which is ambiguity. It is also an essential characteristic of poetry. Jonathan Bate has remarked that the three best known English scholarly critics of the 18th, 18th 19th and 20th hundred of years are Johnson, Hallett and William Emerson. Yes, in 1925, Emerson was a scholarship to Magdalene College, Cambridge. There he studied mathematics. He pursued a second degree in English. At the end of first year, he was awarded with a scholarship. His uh, supervisor in mathematics, Arthur St uh, Stanley Ramsey, expressed regret at Emerson's decision to pursue English rather than mathematics. And, uh, and that he got talent related with English. Uh, so that uh, his uh, teacher helped in laying the foundation for new criticism with I. Richards and therefore practical criticism became enduringly influential in a sense both new criticism and practical criticism are grounded in the same ideas with how the texts are perceived new criticism goes a step further with its underlying beliefs in a sense how your new criticism is practical criticism William Emerson focused on the application of psychoanalytic theory in modern literary theory William Emerson was called as a critic of genius by Frank Carmode. Harold Broom remarked that Emerson was among a handful of critics who mattered to him because of their force and eccentricity. Emerson applied his critical method of the close reading of the text in some versions of pastoral. He extended in the structure of complex words. William Emerson's Milton's Guide is a sustained attack on Christianity, a resistance to John Milton's notion of justify the ways of God to man as presented in the Paradise Lost. The face of the Buddha captures the captivating experience of Buddhist scriptures that Emerson gained during his travel in Japan, China, Korea and Cambodia. This is the next and last uh, uh, critic whose name is C.K. O. Odgan and uh, his full name is Charles K. Odgan. He is uh, an English linguist and philosopher in the mid 20th century. He was born on 1st June 1889. He was died on 20 March 1957. He belonged to an era of contemporary philosophy and the British school of pragmatism. C.K. Odgan co-founded the Heretic Society in Cambridge in 1909 that challenged conventional society in general and orthodox practices and religious dogma. C.K. Odgan and I. Richards were famous in the 1930s for introducing the basic English project, the meaning of meaning and the foundation of aesthetics, both works of I. Richards co-authored by C.K. Odgan, Odgan, uh, Og Ogden, yes, assisted with the English interpretation of uh, Wittgenstein's Tractus Logico-Philosophicus 
which is the only book length uh, philosophical work by ludwig uh, wittgenstein that was published during his time in this way we have discussed uh, unit 8 uh, 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 in the syllabus uh, uh, of uh, NTA UGC NET exam unit number 8 uh, literary criticism so here I want to stop thank you see you